I want to circle back to some of those things, and, and particularly about how that applies to uh, to gender differences. But let's let's move forward in the timeline. Um, you're 14 at that time, and then you attend the first meeting of what ultimately would be the Hammerskin Nation. What what is the Hammerskin Nation? And and also uh, tell us about about Cash. So CASH uh, is an acronym for Chicago Area Skinheads, and that was Clark Martell's group uh, here in Chicago, and that was the first recognized neo-Nazi skinhead group in the U.S. Uh, it started in the mid-'80s. Uh, and by you know, the time I got in in 1987, uh, some small groups and pockets of, of neo-Nazi skinheads had started to appear uh, across the U.S. in places like Dallas and, and Milwaukee and Michigan and uh, and uh, other places, and the idea uh, sprung up that they wanted to bring all these kind of uh, disparate groups in, under one umbrella. Uh, so the idea of creating this Hammerskin Nation, where each state could have its own Hammerskin chapter, uh, but would roll up into a, a national organization, kind of took hold. I was at that first meeting where that was being discussed when I was 14 years old, and, and that was the first meeting uh, that I'd ever been to. And here was a room full of uh, 35 skinheads, you know, much older than me, uh, who, you know, were very angry, who were very focused and militant, uh, you know, who gave fiery speeches and uh, really, you know, instilled this sense of fear that if we didn't do something to protect uh what we thought was being taken away from us, our white identity, um, that, um, you know, we would lose if we didn't revolt. So, uh, you know, the idea took hold to create kind of this national organization, which ended up becoming, uh, still to this day, the most violent and deadly uh, skinhead organization in the world. Was there any, like, uh, did they have any rituals? I mean, did you go through any, like, sort of indoctrination rituals or something like that? Or, I don't know, like um, blood handshakes or stuff like that? No, it wasn't anything like that, but it was the the sheer sense of the propaganda being repeated over and over and over that was uh, the indoctrination. Uh, Part of the ritual was the music. Uh, Music was uh, a probably the biggest propaganda and recruiting tool that we had. Uh, And in fact, I was in uh, two of America's first white power bands um, and the first to to travel overseas to play a concert in Germany in 92. Uh, But, you know, music was propaganda. It was education. uh, It was a social networking tool because it brought people from all different parts of the country together for, you know, the very rare occasions that we had concerts because they were very difficult to have. Um, but you know, you'd have these four or five or six massive festivals where hundreds of people would come in from all over the country and use it as a bonding experience. Um, but there was also a ton of infighting that was fueled by alcohol and insecurity at these concerts. Um, and, um, you know, as far as ritual, it was the way we dressed. Uh, you know, we all maintained a kind of a uniform identity so that we could be seen, uh, and the music, uh, you know, was kind of the common thread that kept us uh, together the same way that, you know, websites like Stormfront or the Daily Stormer do today for uh, that movement. Um, and nowadays, you know, what's interesting is that the movement is metastasized. 30 years ago, we decided that the skinhead look uh, was too offensive to the white American racists we wanted to recruit that was turning them off. So we decided to tone it down, throw our hair out and trade in our boots for suits and go to college campuses where young people were forming ideas and looking for communities, even get jobs in law enforcement or go to the military for training and, uh, you know, ultimately run for office. Uh, And the scary part is it's become normalized and we cannot see what we used to very easily see uh, the look um, is polished. The words are more palatable. Uh, it's it's become part of our mainstream discussion. 
Uh, and that was a strategy to blend in because we knew we needed to be among the people we wanted to recruit. Talk to me about and We're skipping a little bit ahead here, but that's fine. Um, because at, at 16, uh, Clark Martell, when you were 16, Clark Martell ended up going to jail and you were left to be essentially the, the leader, I guess, of cash, right? At that point. Um, and yeah, well, well so. So, I mean, tell me about those strategies. Like when you started talking, like wh- at what point? So you're in that movement for eight years. Um, wh- at what point did you guys start to like talk about this idea that our look is becoming an impediment that, you know, that even though this is um, sort of our, you know, these are our colors. Uh, wh- at what point did you say this is becoming an impediment? You know, I think in the early 90s, uh, David Duke was probably one of the first people to take off the Klan robe and and put on a suit and start to run for office. Uh, So I would say, you know, in in 1990, 1991, it started to become, uh, you know, the fashion to mature into a more normal look. Uh, You saw a lot of people join militia groups uh, and, uh, you know, adopt kind of that more American militant um, movement. Some people uh, who were in the Klan started to to just drop that whole style of clothing and uh, adopt a more Christian fundamentalist uh, look and and viewpoint. Uh, And, you know, it certainly has spread over the years. And, uh, you know, we're calling these groups now the alt-right and and white nationalists, which, in fact, those are terms that I refuse to use because they're marketing terms that that movement made up to seem, you know, a little bit more respectable and less hateful. Um, But, you know, in fact, there's that common thread of white supremacy and and even neo-Nazism throughout all of it. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's taken hold uh, over the last three decades, I would say. Yeah. And I, and I want to return to that in a moment, but, uh, one thing too, that interests me at that time, because that, you know, that era, I was, uh, a little, I'm a little bit older than you. So I, uh, you know, I remember going to, uh, shows and, you know, there were mosh pits and there was, there were skinheads, but they weren't necessarily, it started getting confusing at one point because there were also non- fascist skinheads i mean almost i mean just as as ideologically non-fascist what 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 was that mm-hmm. dynamic about i mean did you run into that stuff yeah i mean most people don't know this but you know when we think about skinheads we tend to think about racist skinheads when in fact uh, you know skinheads didn't start out that way um, you know, there are many non-political skinheads and certainly a lot of anti-racist or anti-fascist skinheads. Uh, but somehow, you know, through the media, they kind of get lumped in, unfortunately. Um, we fought with anti-racist, anti-fascist skinheads, often white skinheads, more often than we did with minorities. Um, and the dynamic was that, you know, kind of what we're talking about Antifa today, that was... Uh, you know, the precursor to that, the, what we used to call anti-racist action or sharp skinhead skinheads against racial prejudice, um, were, you know, really the predecessors to what we're calling the Antifa movement today. Uh, it's nothing new. It's something that's been around for a long time. They certainly aren't terrorists like some people are classifying them. Uh, I would see them uh, as a resistance uh, to racism and to fascism. Um, but yeah, we, you know, the, the dynamic was difficult because we often had people go from one side to the other. Uh, sometimes we would, uh, you know, turn people away who would become anti-fascist, and sometimes they would turn people away who would end up coming to our camp. And in many cases, it was still about this broken search for acceptance that drove people to, to one side or the other. And- and so was there something, I mean, and it's just a question of, I guess, how, how that person's situated as to whether or not they feel like uh, they want to join your skinhead group versus the uh, non-ideological or, uh, you know, or the anti-fascist skinhead group, right? I mean, is it just like, it just happenstance, who gets there first or, or, or just, you know... I mean, stuff that sometimes it depends on 
Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you know, sometimes it depended uh, on their past experience and, you know, maybe how they were raised and who they gravitated to. But it certainly was kind of, uh, you know, this gang fight to, you know, recruit more people. Um, you know, this was already a subculture that was shared based on our looks uh, and sometimes even music. Uh, and, uh, you know, it really didn't take much to get one person from one side to the other uh, because everything else was so similar. But ultimately it was really about... Uh, you know, not about ideology or about territory. It, w- it was about social groups uh, that were at odds with each other. And so um, at one point, uh, you guys get the sort of the notion or the idea starts to, to come into broadly into your community that we need to be like a clean for gene type of situation, I guess, and uh, and dress mm-hmm. up, be more respectable. Uh, and you said people went into, did people go into like the military, into the police departments, um, specifically to recruit? Did they go in there and say like, hey, I'm going to form a beachhead here? Or was it just this is also sort of consistent with, you know, where we want to head to? I mean, how did that how did that work? Well, sometimes it was for purposes of recruitment. Uh, sometimes it was for purposes of, of getting training. Uh, you know, certainly going to the military would allow you to get combat skills for a revolution that we were convinced was imminent. Um, sometimes it was about infiltrating just to be able to change things from the inside. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes it was, sometimes it was a reaction to wanting to get away from the movement. Uh, certain people would say, I want to go into the military or recruit, but really that was their only opportunity to escape us. Uh, and, um, you know, people went through pretty desperate measures, um, to leave, um, and uh, oftentimes they stayed in because they weren't uh, strong enough uh, to walk away from the only identity and community that they knew. Uh, because starting over, once you're, uh, you know, a white, an open white supremacist is difficult. Not only are you, uh, you know, now faced with these friends that have become your enemies uh, and oftentimes want to hurt you, but society has a hard time accepting that somebody may be able to change. Uh, when in fact, you know, we all start out as not racist and we just kind of get detoured down that path for part of our life and hopefully eventually find our humanity again. Uh, so I do believe people can change, um, but sometimes society uh, just won't accept that. So it's difficult to leave and sometimes people stay in, uh, even though they question their ideology and, and and denounce it internally, they won't do it publicly because they can't leave that sense of identity and community.